All right, welcome back to another edition of Intermediate Accounting 1. We're going to jump into Chapter 10, Learning Objective 2, and talk about problems associated with, in general, just what do we capitalize? So we talked a little bit about different types of costs that we can capitalize, like price and fees and things like that. But what if we borrow money to construct an asset? What sort of issues might we come across? Because we can build our own assets for sure. But if it takes some time to build it, like a building takes maybe two years, three years, four years, there's some interest costs that are being, interest expenditures that are being spent. Can't we capitalize those along with architect's fees and things like that? Well, sure we can. But there's like a bit of a debate between how much of this interest we can possibly capitalize. So when you look at, when you consider the two different extremes, one, capitalize no interest during construction versus, hey, capitalize all the interest costs. The VASB comes up and says, look, we need to, we have, a, have to have a hard and fast rule here. Let's say that, let's capitalize the interest that happens just during the construction, right? But even then, we have to put some qualifiers around it. So let's jump into what those qualifiers might be. So what are these qualifiers or these modifications, as FASB likes to call them? Well, it's similar with the historical cost principle. We can capitalize things, uh, capitalize expenditures, anything that it takes to get an asset into place. But we need to consider three sort of hurdles to jump through. The first one has to deal with what is the qualifying, what is a qualifying asset? What sort of assets qualify for interest capitalization? The other one is, over what period do we capitalize interest? Do we do it over a short window, over a long window? Where's the cutoff point? When do we say, stop capitalizing these expenditures and start to report them as expenses? And finally, we'll figure out how much of the interest to capitalize, because there's a few rules there that tend to cause people some frustration. So with regard to the interest capitalization rules, let's look at what are qualifying assets, assets that qualify to be have interest capitalized in them. So the first big one are assets under construction for a company's own use. This is the biggest one. This is the most common. This is the most common situation. But there are assets that potentially we um, build for sale or for lease are constructed as discrete projects, what we call one-offs. Okay. The company is not in the business of manufacturing and selling equipment. It may have a special request because it has specialized knowledge to build equipment for somebody. If there are interest costs incurred in building that machine because it's a one-off type of a project, not something the company does on a regular basis, then it's okay to capitalize interest on those. But in general, you need to understand that only assets where, there are, where there's debt associated with their construction can qualify for any type of interest capitalization. So anything being built by using, through use of long-term debt as financing, those all of a sudden open up the door for interest capitalization opportunities. The second component of interest capitalization asks us to examine the capitalization period. So capitalization begins when expenditures for an asset have been made. Activities for readying the asset are in progress and interest costs are being incurred. So basically, there are things, imagine that the ground is being laid for a new building. There are machines running all over the ground. There's some foundation being poured. That's essentially a capitalization period. That building is in a capitalization period. People are working on the building. You only want to capitalize interest incurred on long-term debt obtained specifically to finance the construction of these qualifying assets. So we're not talking about bridge loans here. Long-term debt means essentially greater than one year long debt. Okay, so we maybe we issue bonds for five years or maybe we have a 10-year note payable with a bank. We stop capitalizing interest or we pause when no activities, no activities are occurring to get the asset ready for use. Okay, so for example, project being halted to obtain a government permit. Maybe the contractors, the construction workers, they have a rule or their union says there's no work done until all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. At that point, the building 
construction has to pause. When that happens, interest capitalization stops. Any interest being incurring while there's a strike, for instance, that needs to be expense. When the contractors go, come off strike, they start working on the building again, now we can start to capitalize interest again. We stop capitalizing interest when the asset has been substantially completed in its construction. Substantially completed basically means, yeah, maybe we have to sweep out a few rooms here and there, but it's ready to be moved in. Now, here's a tricky part about interest capitalization, and that's determining the amount to capitalize. Some people would say, look, if I'm incurring interest, the bank is charging me interest while I'm building a facility. Fine, let's just capitalize that interest straight up. Well, the FASB says yeah, there are some shenanigans that some companies tend to engage in to overcapitalize and under expense on their interest. So the FASB comes up with somewhat this thing called it's a lesser or or lesser of rule. Kind of recall the lower of cost or market. This is another one of those where the FASB steps in and says, don't over capitalize interest. In other words, if you capitalize interest, yes, you're avoiding interest expense. You'll depreciate the interest down the road. So if we're capitalizing, we're necessarily keeping expenses off of our income statement. So the FASB doesn't like that because it sort of seems like we're hiding expenses. So the FASB comes in and says, look, here are some rules, okay? Capitalize the lesser of actual interest costs. Okay, fair enough. Or what's called avoidable interest. And that type of interest is interest that is can be theoretically avoided if it had not made, if the company had not made any expenditures for the asset. So don't worry so much about the trickiness of this definition. We're, I'm going to walk you through and show you how the process works so you understand how and why this rule actually exists. So here's a situation or an example illustration where a company borrowed $200,000 at 12% interest from a bank on January 1st for the specific purposes of constructing a special purpose piece of equipment okay, to be used in its operations. Construction on the equipment began January 1st and the following expenditures were made prior to the project's completion. So anytime I'm giving you these numbers, we have to do some sort of analysis behind it. Don't worry, we'll get there. Let's just keep going on here. The company already has debt outstanding. It has 10-year bonds and a five-year note payable. So in addition to this, what, five, three, this 800 right here, in addition to this 800K, it borrowed an additional $200,000 for a total amount of debt of $1 million. So did it necessarily need to borrow this extra 200000 if it already had 800000 borrows borrowed already from people? Maybe we'll take a look and sort of see how much of this 650 needed to be basically borrowed. So there's a step by step process when we determine the interest capitalization. Okay, the first step involves us asking which assets qualify for interest capitalization. Well, based on the facts that we saw earlier, that the purpose, the the asset that we're building is for specific purposes, um, special purpose equipment. It's for our operations. So does that necessarily qual qualify for interest capitalization? It does. Special purpose equipment qualifies for interest capitalization because it requires a period of time to get ready. And once it's ready, it will be used in the company's operation. So that seems like it is a qualifying asset. How do you contrast that with another scenario? Just think about manufacturers who build special purpose equipment for the purpose of selling it, like Caterpillar. Caterpillar has a lot of bulldozers, right? They provide a lot of special purpose equipment, but their job is, is their whole business is based on leasing and selling all of these big tractors. That's not what we're talking about here. We're saying, hey, look, we're maybe interested in building our own brewing facility and we need to have a certain amount of space a certain amount of drainage etc we don't want to necessarily 
go out and just find some random warehouse. It might be easier to do so. We need to really seriously build this thing from the ground up. It's going to be very spe a very specialized facility. So given that's the case, it's special purpose. It's going to take us some time to build a facility, and we're going to use it for our operations. Anything other than that, we're talking about a company that sells or leases buildings or equipment on a regular basis. Those kind of things, if there's interest, those things get expensed. This is interest that gets capitalized. Now we move on to step two. We got to figure out the capitalization period. Well, we know that this thing, this thing we're building is going to take us about a year to complete. How do we know? Because it began on January 1st, 2020, and its completion is estimated for the end of the current year. That being the case, the capitalization period being from January 1st through Dece 31st suggests that expenditures are being made throughout the period and interest costs are being incurred. So during that long period of time, we're going to be making interest payments to the bank. Those expenditures are interest payments and they qualify to be capitalized, not necessarily expensed right away. So one of the tricky parts about determining interest capitalization is to con calculate this weighted average accumulated expenditure, or Y, whatever you want to call it. I call it Y. Weighted average accumulated expenditure. Basically, what we need to do is say the company is making payments sporadically throughout the year. So what we need to do is compute a weighted average of these expenditures. So the way to look at this is to say, okay, if the company weights the construction expenditures by the amount of time or fraction of the year of the uh, fraction of year that it is being incur that it is incurring those interest charges, how much of the weight what is the weighted average expenditure throughout the period? So the first payment that was made during the period was what was I think it was a hundred thousand on January first. So one hundred thousand, and during that period of time, it was outstanding that payment was made January 1st and it went throughout the entire year so we can say 12 out of 12 months of the year this payment or this expenditure was outstanding so 100% or 12 twelfths when we multiply that across we say that particular expenditure had been outstanding for the entire year but on April 30th we made a hundred and fifty dollar payment to the contractors of our piece of equipment and that expenditure was outstanding eight of the 12 months of the year. So that's approximately 67%, we'll just say. And when we multiply that across, we can say the weighted average of that 150 is actually 100 or two thirds. The other payment that was made on November 1st was outstanding two twelfths of the year, and that was $300,000. And two twelfths is approximately 17%. And you multiply the cross, the weighted average expenditure for that is 50000 And there was a payment on December 31st for $100,000. But because it's essentially outstanding 0 twelfths of the year, we just simply say there is no weighted average amount of expenditures for that particular payment. So when we sum up all these payments, did we make the full 650000 all throughout the year well it was sporadic but we have to take a when we do a weighted average we can kind of figure out how long these expenditures had been outstanding for the period you add the sucker up our y is two hundred fifty thousand dollars now comes another tricky part we have to use that y to compute an actual and avoidable amount of interest we may go ahead and capitalize all the actual interest we make on our interest payments, but we have to go through this lesser of sort of threshold. So when we're determining, the first thing we're going to determine is, and I screwed that sucker up there. Let me just open these up. The first thing we're going to do is determine avoidable interest. Okay, The theoretical interest that the company could have avoided had it not built this specialized piece of equipment. And the trick is we have to divide the YE into two type two different groups. The first group is the portion of the YE that is less than or equal to any amounts borrowed specifically to finance the construction of the asset. So in this case, 
we borrowed $200,000 specifically for the construction of the asset. So the portion of the YE that is $200,000, that's going to be the first group. Any remaining portion of the YE, that's going to be used to determine the remaining amount to be capitalized. So in this case, the way it sort of breaks down as a summary here is our weighted average accumulated expenditures were 250000 The first group, we're going to look at, take the portion of the YE applied to the specific construction debt. So 200000 was borrowed specifically for the construction of the asset. So 200000 of the 250, that's going to be used to determine our overall amount to be the amount of avoidable interest. That means the remaining portion, which in this case is 50000 that's going to be an amount we use to determine the remaining interest to be capitalized. The remaining interest that could be that is used to determine the overall avoidable interest. So down below, I say, look, January 1st and April 30th, we have these weighted average expenditures, and this is just simply from above. We have these weighted average expenditures, 100,000, 100,000. And we are going to apply these 100,000. Oops, excuse me, let me back that up there. Hold on, getting crazy on me. We're going to apply 100,000 of that and 100,000 of that to accumulate into the 200,000 from up above. So that's how we determine that first group. The second group, the 50,000, we're going to say, well, there was a weighted average accumulated expenditure on November 1st, zero for December 31st. We're going to apply those to the second group. So in that case, the 50,000 goes there. Again, why are we dividing this up? Because we're, going, we're trying to figure out avoidable interest. And the FASB requires us to go through some of these hoops. So just get comfortable with this process. Avoidable interest. So now what we have here is a situation where we can start to determine, start to build up our avoidable interest amount. And we determined from the previous slide that the first group has is 200,000 and the second group is 50,000. Well, what is the interest rate applied to that first group? Well, for the first group, the portion of the YE is the amount less than or equal to amounts borrowed, the 200,000. And in this case, we apply the interest rate incurred on those specific borrowings. So the interest rate that we incurred on that $200,000 specific for this project was 12%. So just stick that sucker down there. We multiply those things across and we get $24,000. That's part of the avoidable interest. Now, what about the second portion, the $50,000? Let's look at that next. In the second group, the remaining portion, we want to apply the weighted average of the weighted average of the interest rates incurred on all other outstanding debt. What does that mean? Well, what we have to do is we take a look at that 500,000 that was outstanding and the 300,000 outstanding. And we, we do is we figure out what the overall interest incurred is on an annual basis for those amounts. And in this case, we multiply across the first debt outstanding. And these are the five year bonds. We're paying $70,000 of interest on those bonds, and we're paying $30,000 on the notes payable. We're probably using some of this um, some of this debt to help finance this project. So potentially this is part of the avoidable interest. We wouldn't necessarily be incurring some of these interest payments had we not decided to build this piece of equipment. When you sum these up, you get $100,000 from those two debt streams. Well, if you take the $100,000, and you divide it by this 800,000 total debt, that gets you approximately 12.5% weighted average interest. 12.5% weighted average interest. That's the rate that we're going to use to apply down below, 12.5%. And we're going to apply that to the 50,000. And when we do, we calculate an additional amount of avoidable interest of 6 Two five zero. Oh. You sum those suckers up, and you get your total avoidable interest of thirty thousand two five zero. Oh. In other words, this is interest that we 
potentially would not have incurred had we not decided to build this special specialized piece of equipment. Now you're probably thinking, well, okay, let's just go ahead and capitalize that amount. FASB says, hold on, there are some situations where that is okay and some situations where that's not okay. We still have to figure out actual interest on all the debt. So in this case, the calculation is pretty straightforward. You take a look at, at all the debt amounts, the amounts that are borrowed throughout the year, and you multiply them by their full annual interest. And when you do that, the interest we're paying on the specialized note is 24000 The interest we're paying on the bond, 70, like we saw in the last slide, and 30000 for the other outstanding note payable. Actual interest paid was $124,000 during the year. Now, that's interesting. That basically means that during the year, I had a credit to cash, that current asset account, of $124,000. That is legit cash payment, cash payments that I had to make. But not all of, not that full amount needs to be expensed. I can le pull some of that into the asset account itself. How much do I capitalize? How much do I expense? That's what we're going to look at next. Now again, recall that the rule the FASB instituted was we can capitalize the lesser of avoidable interest or actual interest. So we know what our actual interest paid was, 124000 And we know from the previous slide our avoidable interest was 30250 Which one is the lesser, 30000 or 124000 In this case, it's going to be the 30250 Great. If that's the case, I'm going to debit the equipment account, that's that long-term asset account, for 30,250, which means that the other portion of this cash interest payment that I have to expense, that is 93,750. That's the amount of interest I cannot capitalize. That's going to hit my income statement. That's going to suck but at least I was able to capitalize some of it. So debit, interest, expense on the income statement for 93,750. Not too bad. Now I know we went through that pretty quickly, so let's do another example, okay? Here we have a situation where Shala company cons contracted um, a construction company to create a building to build a facility for 1.4 million on land costing 100,000 purchased from the contractor included in the first payment. Shala made the following payments to the construction company during 2020. So January 1st, 210, 300,000, then 540, then 450. Now I drew this sort of timeline down here because I encourage you all to get used to drawing out timelines very quickly. It's so easy to make a mistake on these type of problems if you're not careful. So drawing out a quick timeline will save you a lot of headache and help sort of facilitate you getting through the problem quickly and efficiently. So the 210,000, that was outstanding from January 1st through December 31st, all the way through to the end. So you can just multiply that by 12 twelfths. And that's gonna get you obviously two hundred and ten thousand dollars kevin's being really good today the next payment was on march 1st and that was three hundred thousand and that was outstanding 10 out of the 12 months of the year when you multiply those the weighted average is 250 and the payment on may 1st was 540 and that was outstanding, eight twelfths of the year. So the weighted average was 360. Why don't I have a line for this guy? Well, that's because it was made on December 31st. So the weighted average for that must be zero. It was outstanding no time during the year. 
So overall, and this is, I believe, what's in your book, too. They sort of show it in their own kind of chart. I like sort of drawing things out, as you know. There's the 210, the 250, the 360, and the zero. So the total weighted average um, accumulated expenditures is 820. And if I may just take a moment right now and just to tell all you finance majors especially, calculating weighted averages has to, has to become second nature to you. So hopefully when you're taking these types of classes, you really pay attention to doing weighted averages and understanding the nature of why they're important. So what was the purpose of calculating a Y of 820K? Well, the reason why we did that is because we're trying to figure out overall how much interest on our debt to capitalize. Well, we don't know anything about debt yet, so let's talk about the debt. There was 750000 borrowed specifically to finance the project, and that had an interest rate of 15%. The other debt that was outstanding, 550 and 600, those interest rates were 10% and 12% respectively. So we're going to go through the same process we saw before in determining avoidable interest, actual interest, and the amount of interest to capitalize. So again, RYE is 820000 and what we have to do is divide that up into two groups. The first group says create a group based on the proportion related to the specific construction debt, which was 750, as we saw from the previous slide right there. So 750 is the first breakout group. That's group number one, which means that the remaining portion of 820, or in this case 70,000, that's going to be used to calculate the other portion of avoidable interest. So Again, when we look at the YE down here, we take the 210 and we apply that full 210 to the first grouping. We look at the 250, we say we're going to apply the full 250 to the first grouping. Now, we have to be careful with this 360 because we are only allowed to build up a total of 750,000 for this first group. That's from up above. So how much of this 360 can we include as far as that first group is concerned? We can include upwards of 290. And when you sum up all these guys together, that's going to get you the 750, which means the remaining portion of this YE payment here, that 70,000, that applies to the second group. And so the second group is 70,000, zero, boom. This is how you determine the two groups. 820 is what still sums up to the YE total. Now, we calculate the YE, the YE groups, and what do we do with those different groups? We apply different interest rates. So the 15% that we saw from the first portion, the specific debt outstanding, we're just going to apply that to the 750, and when we calculate that, we get part of the avoidable interest being $112,500. But what about the extra 70000 What about that other group? Well... In the next slide, I can fill this stuff out for you here so you can follow along with me. 550, let's look at the total annual interest on this. 550 times 10%, 55,000. 600,000 times 12% gets me 72,000. So the total interest on the other debt, not the debt related specifically to the, construct, the building, but the other debt that we have outstanding, we're paying $127,000 for that particular debt. 127,000, 127 divided by 1, 150 million gets me an approximate weighted average interest rate of 11%. And that's what we see down there. I'm gonna take the 70,000 and apply this weighted average interest rate, 11%, and that's gonna get me an approximate 7,730 in avoidable interest. So my total avoidable interest is approximately 120230 Wow, that was exciting, and that was fun. Am I done yet? Not exactly. Now we have to calculate the overall actual interest and compare it to the avoidable interest. So when I look at all the debt outstanding, 750 and apply their annual interest rates respectively, Total interest on the 750 is 112. Total interest on the 550, 70. Total interest on the 600 is 30. The actual interest paid. So again, we're crediting cash. 
a total of 239500 Wow, that's a lot of interest. That's how much interest we are paying in cash, but how much of that do we get to keep off of our income statement? How much can we capitalize? Well, it's the lesser of the 239 or the 120. So in this case, 120 is the lesser. We're going to capitalize this amount so we can debit the building for 120350 so we're not going to expense that interest. We'll essentially depreciate it. The other portion, the remaining 119, 150, that's going to be a debit to the interest expense. And that's going to be on our income statement. So a bit of a bite into our earnings, but hey, at least it's not the full 239. So let's take a look at all of the journal entries associated with this particular set of transactions. We go from the first day one, January 1st, we paid the $210,000. We paid then $300,000, $540,000, and then another four fifty dollars on December 31st. The particular journal entry that we recorded that helps us save some interest from being expensed, that was the 120, approximately 12350. We're going to debit the building's account. And Cash paid for interest was 239 500 and the remaining interest is just going to be expensed. 119 272 And this is the process. This is how we do it. So overall, when you look at this, consider this for a moment now. Do a highlighter so you can see this. How much did the building cost us? Well, here's the first account, 110,000. Next, 300,000. Then 540, then 450. But we were not done. There are still costs that we are incurring while this thing is being built, and we can go ahead and capitalize that into the account as well. We don't have to expense those things. That's the beauty of capitalization. But again, the FASB has its own rules. It says don't overcapitalize as long as you follow these rules. Whatever amount you're capitalizing will be approved by the auditors and by the SEC. Overall, though, how do we disclose this 120000 that we kept off the income statement? Well, there's a couple different ways we can do it. But essentially, if you recall from Chapter, I believe, 3, where we had those different breakouts of subtotals, income from operations was some amount. Then we go into the other stuff, the other expenses, other gains, other losses, etc., in this case, we could probably show explicitly on our, on our multiple step income statement the actual amount of interest expense and the amount that we capitalized, i.e. didn't expense, which resulted in a total amount of 119.272. They use their own sort of rounding. That's how much is truly being expensed. This is at how much is going to be depreciated over the life of the building. So... I'm going to stop there. If you have any questions about this particular learning objective, please let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you on the next video.